Well, my friends, the original plan was for this week's video that we were going to be going on a lovely summery boaty adventure. Sadly, the weather this summer has turned against us once more, so uh, let's have a chat. Hello there, folks. I'm Dan Brown from Sort of Interesting, and today you're joining me on board good old narrowboat Abel's Ark. And I want to chat today about some of the ways that boat life influenced me and affected me that I might not have necessarily realised until I moved away from boat life to dry land and then moved from dry land back onto a boat. And there's a few things here that I want to talk about, the rural nature of boat life and commuting in all sorts of weather from these back of nowhere places. But we'll talk about that later on in this video. So I want to start with specific onboard activity. So... I suppose the more obvious things are the, what happened to my voice then, uh, things like um, the limited resources of electric and water for example. Now the electric one, when I was on Narrowboat Tilly, the stuff inside the boat and same with Abel's Ark is powered simply by running the engine which charges some batteries up and then the lights and water pump and fridge and stuff like that all draws on that power. So obviously if you don't run the engine enough or if you're drawing too much power in the boat the lights can go out and it can get very dark and very limited resources. So basically on Narrowboat Tilly, that would catch me off guard a bit in the winter months, of course, with the dark nights and that, where you'd have the lights on a lot more and for many more hours. And it would literally sometimes, I'd visibly notice, oh, the lights have just gone dark because there's not enough power in the batteries to power the full two tubes in the light fittings and stuff like that. And that's something you'd think after four years of handling and limited electric usage, that going back to dry land, I'd appreciate that sort of flicker switch and there's power. Flicker switch and the heating comes on. Flicker switch and this happens, that happens. But it's amazing and it says a lot about, I suppose, me and human nature. That because it was so easy to just flip a switch and there's power, I didn't think about it at all. And it wasn't until after I came back to boat life and tried to set up the same sort of ludicrous lighting setup that I'd had in the final days of living on dry land that I realised as the uh, I'd have like me laptop plugged in watching Netflix and this ridiculous lighting uh, get up going on and hear the inverter start to beep to signify it had a low level of power to draw from that I was like oh yeah and it, I don't know that was just something I think it's it's sort of just highlighted how easy it is when something's as simple as flipping the switch that you totally don't need, you dis, just completely disregard the whole back end of the situation that actually gives you the ability to flip that switch on. And yeah, anyway, that's just something I wanted to start by saying. Um, but the water thing has more of a, a direct impact because I think on Narrowboat Tilly, with obviously, I mean, you can store your water on your boats, about 150 litres on this boat, I think maybe a little bit more, similar for Narrowboat Tilly. And obviously it's not as if once that water's gone you can never just refill the tank and what have you. But because you'd have to go and physically go to a place like one of the uh, boat services at the side of the canal or hop in a marina quickly to fill up your water tank, it made it something far more of an issue than if the lights went dark, you could just go to the back door, turn the engine key and start charging the batteries again. Whereas the water, you had to physically move the boat somewhere to redo it. Not a huge issue, don't get me wrong, but it's still more of an effort. So I think that water I was far more efficient with and there wouldn't be a moment where if I was just washing like a, a fork or a cup or something, if I'd had a cup of soup or a pot noodle, um, that I wouldn't have the plug in the sink or have the bowl in the sink to make sure that the water wasn't just coming out of the tap, briefly being washed over a cup and then disappearing down the plug hole. It would all be saved up and saved up and what have you. So basically, when I went back to land life, uh, one of the things that stuck with me was my quick showers. Like when I was growing up, I was terrible for having showers that lasted forever. And of course, there was somebody else paying the water and electric bills back then. So it was simpler times. And then um, when I was on Tilly, obviously you wouldn't want to use up too much water. So you'd have very quick showers and think of course over the winter months it'd be very cold and I'd quickly shuffle my ear wrapped in a towel to get in front of the fire to warm up while I was drying off and stuff like that. There's an image for you. Um, but it was one of them things that I think 
after having that as my basic onboard experience, when I then had the option of these extraordinary long shower bath hybrid things that I had uh, where I lived on dry land, it was something that was, oh yeah, it's nice to just relax and have a treat and that. But it almost, when I had a shower, it was something that you want to just get done and over with quick. And I'd hop in and hop out and all the rest of it. And it's, it's quite interesting, really, in hindsight, that then when I came back to boat life, it wasn't that big a deal. Whereas I can imagine if I'd have taken the same attitude I'd had to my usage of electricity, that when I suddenly got into the world's smallest shower on board Abel's Ark, with a really fine streams of water coming out of the shower head to make it high power, but with limited water usage, um, that I would have been like, oh, I've got a feeble shower this is. Whereas instead, it was just one of those things, oh yeah, I've just got used to it and I never really changed. And it almost is a hassle because of that, those sort of... Um, those dark times on narrowboat Tilly of the winter of being like quick just oh the water the warm up water warm up and quickly get in get out and then get warm and dry in front of the fire again again just random stuff there um some of the other things let's go for a walk my friends um goodness me six minutes in this video some of the other things that I suppose are really really core and key to the general living on a boat in a small space experience stuff like my my relative lack of clutter and I've actually got less storage on the boat now than I had at the start of the year because I've removed some of the things that I had I used to have a storage of six little uh, drawer things and it doesn't matter what it was but I've probably got less than half the storage space on board than I had in this top section of the boat at least earlier even in this year and although I've always been a generally sort of minimalist type of character it's not until getting into a boat where you're forced to give some things up and not just have these things at hand and on tap that you realise just how little you actually need if that makes sense and it's something that I noted with life on Narrowboat Tilly that oh yeah ignore this is my uh, makeshift curtain at the minute eh? <laughs> again we won't dwell on that but basically instead of the sort of oh yeah I'm a minimalist and I don't want a lot of stuff and all the rest of it uh, being on a boat, it sort of changed it to, oh yeah, I'm still a pretty minimalist character, but now I've sort of got the proof and the evidence that I don't actually need a lot of stuff, if that makes sense. But yeah, I've got just my small wardrobe on board here, got a little cupboard at the side there, a bit of storage underneath where those doors are, and underneath the bed there's a huge open space for storage that I was originally planning on putting some drawers that could uh, open from the side here so you could use some of the space wasted underneath the bed but ultimately I found that I just haven't needed it and so I've never got round to it and that's something that I had a, a similar experience let's see if I can uh, can I film like this is this gonna wear my arm out on the tripod am I actually even in shot who knows um but basically, there was this interesting thing with moving on to Narrowboat Tilly. I took so much stuff out to the boat that I then started to slowly bring it back and give it to me family and stuff because you had this bizarre realisation of, oh, actually, I don't need this stuff. Oh, I don't need that. Oh, I could do without that. And it sort of just creates this clutter-free environment as you sort of, once you're forced to say, do I actually need this? And then you go, well, not really. And then suddenly it's gone and then you don't because it's not there you don't even think about it and you start to not even realize or notice that it's gone i suppose sleep is a huge part of my life that i've struggled with a lot over the years really and it's not so much the sleeping or getting a good night's sleep it's the getting to sleep in the first place as i've always found it really difficult if i can hear little noises and stuff that i'll focus on it and a lot of people know this feeling where you sort of start focusing and you're listening out for it and you get worked up and especially things like snoring and things like that i've always had a real issue that i'll just be there sort of dwelling on it and, and of course the more you're thinking and winding yourself up and working yourself up the less likely you are to fall asleep and i think that's something that boat life actually made worse to a huge extent where i was suddenly on a little boat being able to moor up in these middle of nowhere places where you would only hear natural noises and you'd obviously get like things scraping or knocking against the side of the boat or certain things like drips of water and all sorts of stuff like that would go on but 
sort of because it was natural sounds, it didn't affect me or wind me up at anywhere near the level that if it was somebody, uh, I don't know, really late at night just working on something in a garage and you could just hear tap, tap, tap and again, or like you say, snoring or stuff like that. And so I think that boat life actually made my sleeping issues worse. And when I moved back to dry land and when there'd be uh, people stopping over, this is a dicey area we've moved into, but if there'd be people stopping over at me place, then there'd be a certain point in the evening, and this would cause me a lot of trouble and a lot of drama, and it never went down well, that I'd be like, oh, uh, I'm just going to go and sleep in the other room uh, on an airbed. Uh, see ya, see ya in the morning. And um. Of course, that was never popular, but it's it's one of those things that I think because I just had that total peace and quiet at night to drift off and get to sleep, that suddenly, again, it, it just made things ten times worse. And it, The weird thing is, it's not even as if I didn't have people stop out on the boat. Well, I suppose over the later years, that never really happened. It was more of an eerie period of boat life. But yeah, that's just something. The proper peaceful nature of boat life actually probably uh, hampered me getting back into like a normal sort of uh, routine. And another thing with sleeping, and this is really weird now, um, because the water tank is on the front of the boat, if you use loads of water, obviously the weight going out of the front of the boat just starts to tip the boat up and backwards a little bit in the water. And that was something, and this is going to get really weird and really a damn brown thing, that as um, as the boat would get more sort of prominent tilt before you filled the water tank, I would sometimes be ill on the boat. Not anything related to that, but in my mind, it settled in at night going to bed, and this is another thing dwelling on stuff, that it was because my feet were like just slightly raised up with the tilt of the boat, that I would feel that that was making me sick. Again, totally ridiculous, I know, so I then started sleeping with my head on the very edge of the pillows so that my head was always tilted downwards like that. And again, totally mad psychological thing that. But once I got into that habit and then moving on to dry land and everything else, I've never, ever been able to get out of it. And it's something, it's another thing that uh, causes problems because people like to have the covers pulled up. But my head's about a foot lower in the bed than a normal person with their head on the pillow. It, it's just one of those really weird things. And again, totally mad. And to this day and all throughout uh, land life and if I stop at people's houses and that... I literally will have the entire pillow and then my head will just be on the very edge of it so that it's tilting. Probably gives me a bad neck as well because of the awkward position. But yeah, that's another negative impact that boat life had on me. <laughs> Something that had a huge impact on me personally with boat life is the fact that it forced me to deal with people. Now, that may not be a big deal to most people out there, but as someone who's incredibly socially awkward and really shy really I suppose in real life to a, a certain extent and in certain ways as some of you have discovered when you've met me out and about on the towpath and stuff um I suppose that I always any possible moment to avoid dealing with people at a bar or this or that or anything I would take that opportunity to make myself scarce basically but then obviously once you're out and about and you need work doing on the boat and things like that and just bumping into people out walking and stuff everybody's so friendly and you just you get far more open and receptive to ah oh, yeah we'll have a chat about some stuff and of course there's the actual practical things where there's a bit like you're going through locks and you're working locks together and stuff and you just have these chance encounters with people and of course there's the mad youtube effect where sometimes i mean i had a little walk down to some shops a few weeks ago and in the space of maybe walking you're talking about hundreds of feet from the boat to a shop and back in Ellesmere, basically. And on three separate occasions in those few minutes, people are like, oh, Dan, oh, I've seen your videos and stuff like that. Again, yeah, it's amazing. It's terrifying. It's great. And everyone's friendly and that. So thank you. But again, it sort of has forced me to be more of a people person, I suppose. It's forced me to grow up and come out of my shell in real life rather than, I mean, it's easy to talk to a camera. There's nobody here and I can choose to not post it if I don't want to. Um, so yeah, that's just something. And it's also sort of helps to illustrate how life is a team effort. And obviously without my friends and family and stuff, and especially when I've had punches on me bike and that, and my granddad's had to come out and rescue me. And 
it, it just shows my life, as I've said in the past, is a team effort. And I'm truly grateful for all of the people, whether you're out here on YouTube watching these videos or out on the towpath helping me do the locks instead of taking ages doing it on my own and stuff. And of course, my friends and family are obviously uh, hugely important and know that very well, I hope. It, it obviously has a huge impact. So yeah, that's just something I wanted to throw in here. Now, to wrap this video up, we'll talk about the, the rural nature of boat life. Now, I've always loved the outdoors. I've always loved to go in walking and cycling thousands of miles a year and stuff like that. And of course, boat life gives you that perfect opportunity to really get out there and just live in nature. And it's something that you sort of see things on the telly and pictures people put up on the internet of, oh, look at this, I saw this particular thing here that's quite rare, or saw that in the outskirts of Oslo Street. And I think once you're actually spending a huge amount of your time and from dusk till dawn and dawn till dusk again, you're out in these really rural farmland sort of countryside areas and you just see a random kingfisher zip by with a hint and a glimmer of that yellow, uh, that yellow, that greeny blue colour under the sun and stuff with their feathers. But you're like, oh yeah, they are amazing kingfisher. And it's just, just happened to be looking out while I was doing the watching up or something like that, seeing herons about and foxes as you're walking around. It, it gives you that great appreciation of just how much wildlife and how much nature there truly is out there, I suppose. And that's just something, another thing I wanted to throw in there. The downside to that is obviously you're living in these pretty remote rural places compared to living in town. And it wasn't until I'd sort of moved back to Oslo Street and had a 10 minute walk to get into work that it started to make me think how mad was I being out in the middle of nowhere on a boat and especially in the winter months there'd be times where I'd literally be awake about 6am be heading into work in the morning so the first thing I'd do is look through the window see it white over glistening with uh, snow and ice or whatever well ice and frost mainly not so much snow and then I'd have to go out onto the back literally scrape the ice off my bike seat before then sitting on it and pedalling into town and the amount of times I fell off my bike in the bad weather and stuff and slipped on the ice and that and it made me think in hindsight that was madness that was madness I did that for four years like hundreds and hundreds of commutes and stuff well thousands potentially going each way and stuff and um, again I suppose with the different weather conditions and that and the fact that I just had to do it it sort of forced me and this is going to sound ridiculous with my squeaky high-pitched voice and my my very uh, flimsy frame here my noodle arms um that it sort of toughens you up in a certain extent because it doesn't give you the choice to back away like you have got to go out and do this you've got to get into work you've got to go and see your friends and family or you've got to go and get supplies so waking up and scraping the ice off your bike and then slipping on the icy backcountry lane because nobody ever goes down there before 7 a.m in the morning is um again it's not the greatest experience of boat life but it sort of did give me that thing that now and on uh, during land life if i get caught out in the rain and stuff i'd be far less sort of upset by it because it was just like well, once upon a time, I was pedalling through flooded country lanes where, as I said, sometimes the weather would be that bad. The lanes would flood and because you have like sort of the banks and the high hedgerows and that, the water would just pool on these lanes. And as I was pedalling, my feet would literally be going beneath the water level of the little floods here and there. So you can imagine the state I was in getting to and from the boat sometimes. And yeah, not the best of boat life experience, but character building. Um, anyway, I've witted at you way too long. I'm sorry about that. So let's just wrap this up and say thank you very much for tuning in. Please do check the links in the description. If you want to help me out, check out my short Kindle books and paperback book about boat life and all that sort of stuff. Feel free to add me on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all that sort of stuff as well. Loads of links in the description. Have an absolutely fantastic day. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hope you've had a wonderful time on board today here. And well, until the next time, my friends, keep it interesting, keep it boatworthy. And of course, my friends, farewell.